Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Ash. I do event coordination for Firestorm Books and Coffee. And I'm really honored to host this event tonight with Peter Cole and Ahmed White in conversation about the radical labor organizing of Ben Fletcher and the IWW. Um, I've had the opportunity to check out the book and learn some of what Peter has to share. And I've got to say that, the, that knowing about Ben Fletcher and the organizing he took part in is absolutely crucial information for anyone working for large scale transformation of our social, political and economic systems and institutions. Um, so I'm really excited to host this discussion tonight. Before going into more depth, I did wanna take a minute and share a few more bits of information about our project and tonight's event. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on occupied indigenous Cherokee, Cherokee territory. We've been a project for almost 13 years now and feature a wide selection of general interest titles and political thought with a focus on amplifying queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture. We've also, we're also an event space that hosts a wide range of readings, workshops, film screenings, and presentations, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. Unfortunately, our doors remain closed to the public due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have been able to shift our operation to an online virtual space, which means our full inventory is available for viewing on, for viewing on our website, and all the titles we discussed tonight can be picked up there. Um, it's been a weird and difficult year to say the least, but Firestorm has been humbled by the support we've received. And it's been really cool to expand our reach and ship books to people across the country and around the world. So if you haven't yet, do check us out at www.firestorm.coop. Um, we've also had a lot of success in converting our community programming to online virtual events. Tonight's event is one in an ongoing series with PM Press, where we've hosted multiple author events and panel discussions on topics ranging from working class history to radical education, to speculative fiction writing, to community self-defense. Um, you can find recorded versions of those events and others on our YouTube channel. And if you're wanting more opportunities to attend these kinds of discussions, as well as other author events and book clubs, you can sign up for our community sustainers program on Patreon, where a small monthly contribution helps support us to continue putting resources toward creating content like this, as well as offers you a 10% discount on all purchases from our store, along with some other cool perks. Um, like I said earlier, tonight's event was also organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press. PM Press is an independent radical publisher that aims to, to deliver bold political ideas and vital stories to all walks of life. Um, we've been collaborating on a series of events with PM Press for a few months now and look forward to hosting more events in the future with the next one scheduled for Saturday, May 8th as a conversation with anarchist writer and historian Gabriel Kuhn about their latest book, Liberating Sot Me, Indigenous Resistance in Europe's Far North. Um, if you're interested in staying up to date on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on social media, as well as our website's community calendar. Um, Cool. So that was a lot of information I shared there. Uh, if you're interested in any of that, I will be dropping links to all of these things in the chat and in the comments section for those following on the live stream. As for tonight's event, we're here to discuss this book, Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. Um, it's the revised and expanded second edition of the book. And if you've not gotten a chance to check it out yet, I really hope that you do 
Peter Cole makes a convincing argument that Fletcher is one of the greatest black radicals in United States history. And his meticulous research uncovers a comprehensive look at Fletcher's life and political activity and provides important lessons about what it can look like to build workers' power through anti-racist organizing. And that's something that feels incredibly important in our current moment. Um, Peter will be joined in conversation by Professor of Law, Ahmed White, and they're going to talk for about 30 to 45 minutes after Peter offers an initial presentation. So for folks who are attending on Zoom who want to ask questions, um, I'll encourage you to just submit questions throughout the discussion. Uh, no need to wait to the end for, you know, it, it, a specific Q&A section. Uh, I'll just encourage you to submit those questions throughout using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll either be able to sort of organically work those questions in the, in the, discussion, in the discussion period, or we'll come back to them at the end. Um, so with that, I will introduce tonight's guest and then we'll get started. Peter Cole is a professor of history at Western Illinois University and a research associate in the Society Work and Development Institute at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Cole is the author of the award-winning Doc Worker Power, Race and Activism in Durban and the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, as well as Wobblies on the Waterfront, Interracial Unionism in Progressive Era Philadelphia. He co-edited Wobblies of the World, A Global History of the IWW, and he is the founder and co-director of the Chicago Race Riot of 1919 Commemoration Project. Ahmed White is a professor at the University of Colorado School of Law, where he teaches labor and criminal law. His research focuses on the history of labor repression and the, and the role of law and the state in shaping class struggles. White is the author of The Last Great Strike, Little Steel, The CIO, and the Struggle for Labor Rights in New Deal America. Ahmed, Peter, thank you so much for being here tonight. And Peter, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you to Ash for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with um, people in, on Facebook and on Zoom. I am talking to you from Chicago and soon you will not see me. It's because I'm gonna share my screen and show you a presentation that hopefully is more interesting than looking at me. And then I'll be back in 30 minutes or so, I promise. All right, so again, thank you so much to everyone for sort of being with us this evening. So Ben Fletcher was the most important leader of the IWW's most effective interracial union, which controlled the Philadelphia waterfront for a decade through its militancy and direct action tactics. Fletcher is one of the most important black labor figures in US history, yet very few people, even on the left, know his name. Nevertheless, he couldn't be more relevant to the most urgent political projects of the present. And I hope you'll agree after you listen to me talk more about him. I placed Fletcher squarely at the center of worker organizing in the early 20th century, which meant that he had to be reckoning with the ever twinned dynamics of race and class, not to mention the potentials and limits of direct action versus bread and butter unionism in an interracial and later predominantly black labor union. Fleshing out Fletcher unsettles, I believe, not only US labor history, but also the histories of American radicalism, of black studies. Fletcher was more than just a black wobbly. He also exemplified what was called the new Negro experience of the post-World War I era, though he has never really been included among its intellectuals, artists, and activists. If you think that in the 21st century, that we live in a time of extreme racism, xenophobia, and inequality. Um, let me just tell you that the early 20th century was even more so, and um, that was the time, of course, that Ben Fletcher was organizing and living. So Ben Fletcher, 
African-American man born in Philadelphia in the last decade of the 19th century, 1890. His parents, who we know very little about, was well, quite possibly, um, they were born enslaved. We do know that his parents were born in the 1850s, which was before the Civil War and before the 13th Amendment was passed, um, and that they moved from the South into uh, Philadelphia um, in the late 1880s. Why? Well, again, we're not certain, but it's reasonable to conclude that they um, were pulled by the economic opportunities that they hoped to find in an industrial city like Philly, um, as well as to escape the horrors of Virginia, which was in the um, aftermath of the demise of Reconstruction in which the rise of Jim Crow will emerge actually in the 1890s. So in other words, to escape the pervasive racism of the South in order to find better opportunities um, outside of the South. Sadly, when they arrived in the city of Philadelphia, they would quickly learn that racism was in Philadelphia too. In fact, the great black intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois wrote his first book about Philadelphia in the 1890s when he was living there for a while. And he basically said that racism defined the experience of black people in Philadelphia, especially on the job, meaning that black men and black women looking for work um, had very, very narrow opportunities because of the, the widespread employment uh, well, I should say because of the widespread uh, discrimination of white employers who time and again um, prefer to hire white Philadelphians or European immigrants to African Americans. Um, in addition to that, the city was very widely known as being pretty conservative, including in its economic um, situation. It was very hard to organize unions and one textile worker a uh, union organizer referred to Philadelphia as a scab town, um, as well as the graveyard of unionism. Despite those obstacles, Ben Fletcher joined the IWW when he was around 20 years old in 18, excuse me, around 1910. Um, he also would have joined the Socialist Party around that time, although he later will drop out of the Socialist Party. Um, we don't know what he did for a living all the time, but we know that he was what was often referred to then as a day laborer, meaning that he worked uh, manual labor jobs, often for a short duration, sometimes just for the day. And that included working um, loading and unloading ships on the waterfront, a subject I'll touch more about um, in a while. Um, we know also that uh, when he joined in 1910, 1911, he very quickly becomes a sort of, a, not just a member of the industrial workers of the world, but also an organizer in it and a very well-known speaker. Um, uh, at that time, in that era, it was common for people who remember this is before even radio exists, let alone TV or the internet. Um, how do you reach people? Um, mass communication exists on print, but if you want to find people in in the city, you actually go to the streets, right? And so um, Fletcher would have spoken on street corners um, uh, in Philadelphia, as well as neighboring towns. Um, and it was common for such speakers to um, um, carry around a, a wooden box nicknamed a soapbox so that you could stand on it so you could be above essentially the rest of the crowd. Ben Fletcher happened to be short um, and so he maybe even had to carry two soapboxes around right um, but in order to get above but we already hear and see him in 1912 being praised in the pages of um, newspapers by the IWW. What is the industrial workers of the world about? For those who are unfamiliar, let us go back to 1905, 1905, um, which was the year that the union was founded, it was founded in the city of Chicago, um, actually just a few miles from where I'm talking to you right now. Um, the, uh, in that time period, 1905, corporations totally dominated the United States of America. There were literally no government regulations. The first industrial regulations didn't pass until 1906. Um, a very small group of um, uh, people who we will call capitalists basically controlled um, the great industries of the country, including the steel industry that uh, Professor White has written about uh, extensively, um, and the government would do the bidding of these uh, corporations, um, regularly deploying the police or the army in order to break workers' uh, strikes and unions. Um, the working class was very weak, very few uh, workers were in unions. Most of those were in the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, um, which chose to not organize most women, chose to not organize most black workers, chose to not organize most immigrants, chose not to organize the so-called unskilled, um, and for its members was only interested in trying to earn more money and um, improve conditions. Sometimes that's nicknamed bread and butter unionism. Racism was also rampant in 1905 in the United States. Um, just nine years after the Supreme Court ruled in Plessy v. Ferguson, um, immigration was very high in that era, um, but xenophobia was growing. And as people get, came together in Chicago in 1905 to found the IWW, 
Um, it was uh, very intentionally um, to be a sort of an, a radical alternative to the AFL. Um, among those who joined, uh, helped found the IWW included Eugene Debs, the founder uh, and leader of the Socialist Party, um, Big Bill Haywood, um, the leader, a leader in the uh, most militant socialist uh, minor union in the West, uh, Mother Jones, uh, the socialist um, coal mining organizer and child labor abolitionist, um, Lucy Parsons, a uh, black anarchist in Chicago, um, originally from Texas, who um, uh, was the widow of Albert Parsons, one of the Haymarket martyrs, right? Um, members of the IWW very much um, believed that capitalism was the main problem in their country and world, um, but also that capitalism was a global phenomenon, and that is why they named their union the Industrial Workers of the World. Some people suggested at their founding convention they name it the Industrial Workers of America, and that was rejected um, for the internationalist um, vision, right? Um, but also because of the understanding that the uh, that capitalism was a global phenomenon, right? Um, as this classic IWW poster suggests, uh, created in 1911. Um, you know, the economic system was designed by the few for the few, um, and that, but that the great majority received very little out of it, right? So the IWW advocated, as did others on the left who are socialists, who are anarchists. Um, later on, uh, communists will be added to that mix, right? Um, who condemn capitalism for basically being unfair and unreformable, and therefore had to be overthrown in, in lieu of a socialist world. Um, how is this done? It was done by organizing the masses, the working people, the great majority of people. Um, and that is why their motto, an injury to one is an injury to all, which is um, enormously popular as a slogan. Many other unions will later adopt it because of its common sense power, right? Um, will sort of exist. Now, um, specifically Ben Fletcher and the union that he is associated with um, were dock workers. They were also sometimes called longshoremen because they work along the shore. Right? That means that they load and unload ships right? um, in Philadelphia and in every other port city in the country and world, the process of hiring in the early 20th century was similar. In the US, it was called the shape up and basically hundreds of men at that time, the industry was all male, would show up at say the foot of a pier in order to get selected to work loading or unloading a ship. Right, um, uh, but there, if there's 200 people who show up in 50 jobs, uh, the hiring boss gets to pick and choose. Uh, the hiring boss can play favorites. The hiring boss can pick those who he likes, those who he has shares a race or a religion or a neighborhood affiliation with, those who are willing to bribe him, etc. Right, the shape up divides workers, weakens workers, drives wages down, makes workers weak. Right, workers hate the shape up. Right, um, bosses love the shape up. Right. Um, if you get hired for a job that day, Ben Fletcher would have been already working on the waterfront before he becomes a union leader. Right. Um, the work is very dangerous. I always say that literally any day you walk onto the waterfront, you might die. Right. Um, and that is the nature of the industry. Uh, a lot of injuries, a lot of death. Right. Um, very heavy manual labor. It was not uncommon for workers to be able to have to carry two or three hundred pound sacks on their back up and down ladders on moving ships in daylight and in night, in rain and in uh, sun, in winter and in summer, right? Um, uh, in all sorts of weather, right? Um, and after you do that shift or maybe finish working that ship, you may not have another job for a week or a month, right? Um, that is the nature of casual um, labor, sometimes now referred to as precarious labor. Despite all the problems that dock workers experienced on the job, the work itself actually was part of the solution, you might say, um, because workers had to labor together, right? Um, it was often dock workers worked in pairs and whole gangs of men would work a ship. A ship might have five gangs with say 20 people in a gang. So there might be as a hundred or even more men working a single ship, um, all working together. The nature of the work creates an in, uh, sort of a common identity, but also a powerful division between workers and bosses, right? Very few, I should say almost no workers advance to become the captain of a ship or the owner of a shipping company, right? Um, and so there's a very clear class divide right, um, us versus them. Which side are you on? I know which side I'm on, right? Um, and so the nature of the work is important for us to keep in mind. And I also like to always point out as a sort of a historian of maritime world and historian of um, maritime labor that uh, it is because of the ship, because of shipping, um, that Europe rises as the most powerful um, imperial region in the world in the 15th and 16th and 17th century. It is literally the ship that allows European powers to sort of conquer the world as well as to spread capitalism worldwide as it develops first in Western Europe in the 18th 
century, 17th and 18th century. In other words, shipping is central to the European imperial project as well as to capitalism. Um, it also sort of is perhaps central to um, the overthrow of capitalism. Um, in fact, the, the workers' arguably greatest power is, is the strike, that is to stop work. Um, but many people are unaware of the origins of the term. It came from London in 1768 when sailors who wanted a raise took down the sails of their ship so that the ship would not move until they got a raise. Now, the nautical term for taking down the sails of the ship is to strike the sail. And that word in that moment becomes later until our time, the de facto term we all use in English to describe work stoppages of any sort, right? And so that also tells us the centrality of maritime and shipping to this world that we live in. Um, now, in 1913, a few years after Fletcher had joined the IWW, Philadelphia dock workers go on strike. Um, they strike for um, a raise, but also for union recognition, which was not uncommon at that time, right? In 1913, uh, the demographics of the Philadelphia waterfront was very diverse, approximately a third African-American, a third Irish and Irish-American, and a third immigrants from other European countries, think Italy and Poland and Russia and um, the like, right? Um, bosses loved diversity on some levels, because they could play ethnic and racial and national groups off of each other very easily. And it was common for employers to use all um, segregated gangs. So example, an African-American gang, an Irish gang, a Polish gang, um, where they would be um, pitted against each other by the bosses in order to further weaken workers and increase productivity. And workers in the spring of 1913 had had enough and they went on strike. Um, in the midst of these two week strike, they actually um, received their charter from the IWW, which was called Local H. Um, in addition, um, the IWW instituted immediately um, a uh, strike committee in which every ethnic or racial group with someone on strike had a member on the committee, right? And so what we might call today representation, right? Um, uh, the dock workers win their strike, win union recognition, win a raise, and then everything changes. As soon as Local 8 gains power, they start to institute some radical changes on the waterfront, particularly what we would now call, although it was not used then as a concept or a term, anti-racist actions, right? The union started to integrate their work games. And so once the uh, um, union had power, they got rid of the shape up, which I'll talk more about in a second, but they also started to dispatch workers in ethnically and racially mixed gangs. In other words, suddenly black, and Polish and Irish Americans work together in these gangs. They also demanded uh, sort of rep equal representation among uh, the leadership ranks and the elected leaders of the union and all social events. And so very quickly, Local 8 became integrated overnight. I say that this is 51 years uh, before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and I sometimes refer to this as integration from below. In addition to these dramatic changes, the IWW got rid of the shape up. Right? And so instead of the um, workers basically asking for jobs, hat in hand at the waterfront at 7 a.m. in crappy weather and maybe not getting a job, now the bosses will call up the union and say, we want workers to be sent to our pier um, tomorrow morning, for example. Right? That's how the union was able to control, um, well, get rid of the shape up, but also sort of um, end segregation. Um, every month, members of the union would have to pay their monthly dues, a very small amount, but nevertheless a little, right? And in exchange, they would receive a button. We can see a few of these in these photographs, right? Um, and then members could see who was sort of a full up member of the union and who wasn't, because sometimes bosses wouldn't want to. Bosses hated the IWW. They didn't really want to hire them. They only hired them because the dock workers in the union had power, right? And the only way they had power was they could enforce it on the job. And so if, for ex in example, employers tried to hire non-local eight members, then the other uh, dock workers who were in the union who could see each other's buttons would say, hey boss, you gotta fire these guys and hire only us. And if you don't, we're gonna walk, right? Um, we're gonna strike, right? Um, dock workers um, in local eight did not sign contracts because they did not want to give up their most powerful weapon, the strike. They also would celebrate their birthday with an annual strike. Um, the first time they did this in May of 1914, the bosses said, if you don't come that Saturday morning, um, you don't have to come Saturday afternoon. Uh, by Saturday afternoon, after thousands didn't go to work but celebrated themselves with a parade and a party, um, the employers were begging um, the workers to come and do a night shift. What I'm describing in Local 8 is not unique to Local 8, although Local 8 is particularly um, powerful because of its multiracial composition. Um, but the ideas, many of the ideas that Local 8 in institutes in practice are actually ideas that the IWW developed from their birth in 1905 and carried forward. 
One of those I already mentioned, they don't sign contracts with employers because labor contracts almost always have a no strike clause and the IWW did not want to give up their um, potential power to strike, which um, the Wobblies constantly said was the single greatest power that workers had. Um, often this was called direct action um, because the strike, the threat of strikes, slowing down on the job, et cetera, are all ways that workers collectively can demonstrate power in their workplace. I should note that even if you don't have a union, even if you don't have actually formal agreements, even if they're oral agreements, workers who are coordinated in their efforts on the job can do these things today in the same way that they were done in 1913 in Philadelphia. Now the union is called the Industrial Workers of the World and I'll just um, take a, a minute to sort of um, talk about how it was IWW sailors who literally delivered IWW propaganda, um, literature and ideas to other countries around the world. Very quickly the IWW spread um, to Canada and Mexico, um, southward into the Caribbean and to South America, um, westward to Australia and New Zealand, um, eastward to Britain and Ireland, to continental Europe, southeast to South Africa and beyond. I cannot emphasize how much the IWW was able to in under a decade spread to more than a dozen countries, right? Then to 20 countries um, uh, around the world. I'm highlighting here the image on the left, uh, sort of the IWW's famous Little Red Songbook translated into Finnish. Um, or actually, I really love this photograph on the right, it comes from New Zealand, um, where Wabwe's organized mine workers, and the IWW was the first white union in New Zealand to organize Maoris, who were the indigenous population, and the IWW newspaper in New Zealand actually had a Maori language column in order to appeal directly to Maori workers. Right? Um, and these are examples, in other words, of anti-racism outside of the United States, not just in the United States. In Philadelphia, back in Philadelphia, um, Local 8 continued to hold on to power during the war and after the war, although I'll talk more about that. Um, meanwhile, Ben Fletcher was often um, sort of dispatched to other ports in order to organize because of his abilities, right? And so he would be sent up to Boston, uh, over to Providence, Rhode Island, over to Baltimore, down to Norfolk, Virginia, and so on. Right. Um, it was in Norfolk, Virginia in early 1917 that Fletcher was organizing among dock workers. Uh, the photograph on the left is a Norfolk waterfront. The image on the right is actually of a Norfolk dock worker. Right. Um, Fletcher was um, organizing workers. It's a multiracial union that he's a part of as well as a socialist. And he's a black man organizing union uh, in the South in 1917. And not surprisingly, some white people, maybe organized by the bosses, threatened to lynch him. Um, that was no idle threat. In 1917, more than 100 black men a year were being lynched on average in the early 20th century. And so uh, Fletcher was smuggled out of Norfolk, um, headed to Boston, where he uh, actually spent several months in uh, spring and summer of 1917. That is where um, the federal government found him in June of 1917 and started to spy on him. So in April of 1917, a few months before that, the United States had declared war against Germany, entered World War I. As soon as the war begins, um, and as Professor White knows far better than me, the federal government created laws, Congress passed the Espionage Law, later the Sedition Act, uh, in order to basically criminalize dissent. Anyone who was critical of the war um, was subject to punishment by the federal government. Um, and the first target of the federal government in 1917 and 1918, in what later becomes known as the Red Scare, or the first Red Scare, was the IWW. Fletcher and several hundred other Wobblies were arrested in various cities across the United States, and about a hundred of them were brought to Chicago for a mass trial in the spring and summer of 1918, um, where they were charged with espionage and sedition. Um, it is during this time that Fletcher's humor becomes better known to people outside of his immediate circles. Um, during the trial, he turned to his friend, Big Bill Haywood, and said, um, you know, if, the, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no color at all in this trial. Later on, um, when the jury came back in under an hour and found all 100 or so of these um, wobblies guilty of all counts and started to read off the punishments, um, Fletcher again turned to Haywood and said, you know, the judge is using very poor grammar today. And Haywood said, how's that been? And Fletcher said, because the judge's sentences are much too long. Much of Fletcher's humor turned on the absurdity of racism, but it also sort of, his sort of humor, which is not uncommon in the IWW, suggests a level of intelligence, right? Um, that uh, belies the fact that he never graduated high school. 
Fletcher received a 10 year sentence in a federal prison. Um, every wobbly on trial was sentenced to five to 10 to 20 years and tens of thousands of dollars of fines. If you adjust for inflation, you're talking multiply that times 10 approximately and you've got what we're talking about. Fletcher will be sent to Leavenworth, Kansas to the large notorious federal prison in Eastern Kansas, um, just west of Kansas City. Um, the image here of Fletcher and that also graces the cover of course is the photograph of him um, as he was being processed as he arrived in Leavenworth in late 1918. When Le Fletcher and these other Wobblies um, arrive in Leavenworth, they're, they're not alone, right? Um, there are many other radicals who have been punished by the federal government in 1918 and also in 1919. Um, anarchists, communists, revolutionaries, religious objectors, and others were all sort of thrown together in what my friend Christina Hetherington has nicknamed the University of Radicalism. Now, Fletcher was not uh, verbose, at least uh, when it came to writing, unfortunately. Um, and so we don't know what he thought so much about prison, although he um, did write letters and receive letters. And thanks to the federal government spying on him and other political prisoners, we know the contents of many of those letters. Um, but another one of his fellow inmates who he would have been friends with was a man named Ricardo Flores Magón. Uh, Magón was a famous Mexican anarchist and revolutionary who, along with his brother and others were in something called the PLM, the Mexican Liberal Party, but don't be fooled by that word liberal, they were revolutionaries. Magone writes about his time in Leavenworth, right? Um, and he described it as such. Um, he felt caught by the formidable mechanism of a monstrous machine and my flesh gets ripped open and my bones crushed and my moans fill the space and make the very infinite shudder, but the machine will not stop grinding and grinding and grinding. <laughs> Fletcher, as I already noted, um, wrote letters extensively to friends and family while in prison. And again, thanks to federal surveillance of all such correspondence, many of which uh, these letters are in the book, um, uh, we actually can learn who he was corresponding with, what he was thinking in some level of depth, et cetera. Of course, he would have known that he was being spied on. Um, in one letter, he wrote to a socialist friend in Milwaukee on New Year's Eve, 1920. He wrote to her, um, we are living in momentous times. None of us are gifted with the power of clairvoyancy as to be able to foretell the day or the hour. Therefore, the first and most important duty is for all of us to prepare ourselves for the final chapter in the life of capitalism. Now, despite the massive repression during and after World War I, Local 8 actually held on to power on the waterfront because they had united um, a strong group of approximately 5,000 dock workers during World War I and after. Um, even the US Navy, which of course was another branch of the government that had just uh, imprisoned Fletcher and five other Philadelphia Wobblies, um, still only hired Local 8 members during the war. Um, after the war, Local 8 tried to extend its power in various ways, including trying to achieve the eight hour day with a massive strike in 1920. Um, and then later um, in 1922, Local 8 was locked out by its bosses um, uh, with major support from the city and the federal government. The federal government was literally subsidizing and the importation of strike breakers from other American ports. And with also the rival union and the AFL wanting to sort of destroy um, the power of IWW, um, the union is weakening. Um, I also like to highlight that um, racism has been rising rapidly after World War I, during and after World War I, and xenophobia too. And so, you know, these forces make it much harder for a multi ethnic, multiracial, multinational union to sort of survive. In addition to the fact that the communists had risen on the left as another challenge to sort of the IWW. And as a result of all these different forces, in, 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 uh, without going into too much detail, Local 8 will sort of basically split up in late 22, early 1923. And so Local 8 will basically no longer sort of be able to represent effectively the majority of dock workers, although it will not entirely disappear for some years. Um, nevertheless, uh, The Messenger, uh, the, the legendary black radical new magazine of A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen based in Harlem, still referred to Fletcher the following year as the most prominent Negro labor leader in America. A few years on, the AFL and the IWW are continued to compete for power on the Philadelphia waterfront. And in 1927, actually, dock workers in Philadelphia choose to affiliate with the AFL. They are still a branch of the American Federation of Labor's ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association. Um, they did win an eight-hour day as a result of that, and that was beneficial. Um, however, the union was very anti-democratic. Um, the corrupt nature of dock workers in New York City are, are well known as 
in the feature film fictionalized but somewhat real on the waterfront or even in the um, fictionalized but very real TV show The Wire um, set in Baltimore in the early 21st century, you see the sort of undemocratic nature of actually the Atlantic Coast Union that represents stock workers to this day in that region. Um, unfortunately, the AFL um, ILA either chose to allow it or didn't oppose it in the first place, but the shape up returned. And so dock workers were more exploited. Um, segregated gangs also returned and would remain in force until the late 60s and early 70s. Um, so it was only the Civil Rights Act and then multiple federal lawsuits that resulted in the union fully integrating itself 60 years after the IWW had done so. And the neighborhoods also became less hospitable to black people along the riverfront. Um, the amazing photograph or poster, I should say, on the left of the I created by the IWW in the early 1920s so, uh, suggests what I've also already done, which is that the IWW continued to be anti-racist and Fletcher continued to be an active leader and speaker in the IWW. However, Local 8, the power on the Philadelphia riverfront um, for almost 10 years was no longer the uh, reality. Around 1930, maybe 1931, Ben Fletcher will move to New York City. Um, he'll be an IWW organizer there and will meet many Wobblies. Um, unfortunately, he will suffer a major stroke in 1934. He also have other health problems, which he writes about in his letters to friends, which is how I know about them. And his wife, his second wife, will probably be the primary breadwinner. Um, they live in Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Bedford Stuyvesant or Bed Stuy, which um, is well known nowadays. In the 30s, when they moved there, it was not predominantly black, nor was it in the 40s, but it became more and more heavily black um, in the post-World War II era. Um, he'll die in 1949, only at the age of 59, and really his last 15 years were he was weakened. Uh, but he remained deeply committed to the IWW and remained very good friends with various wobblies and anarchists throughout um, his years in New York City. Um, he was buried in an unmarked grave in Brooklyn, not far from where he lived. Um, although there's a group of us in New York City, in the IWW and outside of New York City, um, who are working to um, raise funds in order to sort of get a major headstone and maybe some other um, marker for him in New York City in Brooklyn, but also further down the road, hopefully maybe an awesome mural in his hometown of Philadelphia. To conclude, I would say that Ben Fletcher was um, a deeply impressive person. Um, some people considered Local 8 and Fletcher to be too conservative because they actually had sort of formed a durable union that did things like represent the workers in sort of their sort of short-term economic interests. However, other people saw them as way too radical, either because of their belief in socialism, their belief in industrial unionism, um, but also their belief in sort of um, fighting racism and xenophobia. Um, although no one had to tell Ben Fletcher that racism was real in the United States of America, um, but it is important to highlight that he was um, very much prioritized socialism, which is to say that he saw that capitalism was the primary enemy of black workers. Um, and um, he didn't think that you could just snap your fingers and get rid of racism by any means, but he and other wobblies, including in Local 8, were primarily focused their attention and anger towards the bosses, right? Um, the ultimate goal, in other words, was um, the uh, a socialist world, right, um, in which we could all live. Even when he died, the conservative black newspaper in Atlanta, The Daily World, referred to Fletcher as a one of the most brilliant Negroes ever associated with a leftist organization. Um, and he also even had an obituary in the New York Times. Um, I very much appreciate everyone's attention and look forward to talking with my friend, um, Professor White. And um, thank you all, um, as well as the Firestorm books. Thank you, uh, Peter. I, I can't say how happy I am uh, to be part of this. This isn't the first time you and I have shared the stage. Um, and, and I can tell our audience today, um, aside from this book, about which I'll say a little bit in just a second, and Peter, I hope we'll say more. Um, Peter's been just such a, such a tremendous resource, and I've learned so much from him uh, about the Wobblies at, at a time when, as, as he and Ash both pointed out, it's hard to imagine the legacy of this organization being more, uh, more relevant um, to us than it is today. And I, I think this book is just, uh, is just absolutely wonderful in, 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 a, in, in numerous ways. I'll only point to a couple um, before I kind of get into a, 
some of the questions. Um, one, one is that it, it just, it does something that I really appreciate and, and, and that I think it hasn't been done near enough um, in, um, in, in, in labor history. Um, and that is to tell the human story of who these people were um, and, and what, they, what they accomplished and, and frankly, what they endured. Uh, to accomplish what it was that they that they left for us, um, and and I, I think the book the book the book is is just tremendous in that uh, in that regard, uh, very very moving. Um, it's also resonant with me personally, and I'll just make a, a brief reference to this. And I didn't find out until fairly late in my father's life that uh, he was a dock worker um, for a time in Houston. Uh, that would have been in the early 1960s. Um, he later was, like Ben Fletcher, although in a, in a different cast, um, a, a civil rights uh, champion. He was a civil rights lawyer, though I hasten to add, not the kind who had any money, uh, who appeared on television in fancy suits or who had you know, vacation homes in the Rockies or the seacoast or that sort of thing. Um, although his life was not as, as challenging um, as has been Fletcher's. Um, there are a couple of uh, interesting questions, I think, in the uh, in the Q and A, and I'll, I'll hold off on those because I think I think we we decided we would, we would maybe push those back a little bit just for organizational purposes, and uh, and and now proceed with maybe some questions uh, from me to. Um, um, to Peter, uh, of which I have more than, than, than we could possibly fit into the time uh, that we have here. Uh, and so I'll, I'll pick just a few of them. Um, one is, is kind of um, anticipated by something you said, Peter, towards the end of your presentation. It's something that really grabbed me about um, Fletcher's story and the way you tell it. And, and that's the way that local aid and by extension, Fletcher himself was so often cast as as simultaneously um, too conservative and too radical, and and one context in which that really comes out with with some fateful effects uh, is in um, the so-called Philadelphia controversy, um, where the union uh, found itself, um, as you um, um, so very effectively describe it. Uh, besieged um, by, um, put it plainly, by, um, by, by pressures from the, the ascendant, the time ascendant communist uh, movement at the same time that local aid was also uh, in difficulty with uh, the IWW itself, with the international, um, on the question of, of centralization, um, where there was this controversy between or this conflict between centralizers and and, um, and decentralizers, um, and I, you know, I wonder if if there's something to say about that as it relates to the complexity of politics and labor politics in particular, both in the 19 teens and 1920s and today. I mean, we we both teach different sides of this issue, and our audience is 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 is, is uh, also, I'm sure, quite engaged with this and, and, and sometimes run up against this, the inadequacies of conventional ways of understanding politics and, and, and understanding ideology. And so that's a kind of long-winded question and a wind-up to a question, but I wonder, if, I wonder if you can say more about that as it defines a guy like Ben Fletcher, defines the IWW, and speaks to their legacy for us. Well, thank you for those comments and questions. And I appreciate, you know, telling the story of a, I'm a historian, right? The rudest story, right? Um, why do people like history? It's because they like stories, right? Like, uh, and so um, telling a story, then how do we relate to it? Yeah, and so we can relate to other human beings, right? Um, and so um, telling history through biography is actually not my expertise. This is the only book I've ever done that was sort of biographical. Um, but it is a wonderful way um, to sort of tell a story because it's because we all sort of can relate. Yeah, um, as uh, 
human beings ourselves, right? Um, we also can relate to sort of the heart of your comment and question, which is that life is complicated, right? Like uh, I wish it was simple, but it isn't. And so the Philadelphia controversy is a complicated chapter, which I choose not to discuss in the presentation, but I'm very happy you raised it, right? Like, so basically after World War I in 1920, uh, the union, Local 8, was suspended from uh, the larger union, the IWW, right? It had been accused by another, by maritime uh, union organizers in New York City in the IWW of loading weapons for the anti-Soviet forces in the Soviet Civil War. So after the Soviet Union was born, that sort of there was a count, there was an attempt to overthrow the Soviet Revolution, right? Uh, and then there is uh, several years of war in which the United States supports the opponents of the Bolsheviks, right? Like uh, who are nicknamed the Whites, with the Communists being the Reds. Yeah, um, just to confuse us because the Republican Party, unfortunately, in America is now considered red, which is only because television networks made that choice in the 90s, and now we're all stuck with red and blue, right? Like, uh, but red means communist, right? <laughs> Not Republican. Right. Um, so Local 8 denied loading weapons for the whites. They never knew uh, sometimes what they were loading. Often dock workers don't really know what the hell they're loading on ships when they're told to do it, but they didn't intentionally load weapons. And I should say in my research, I've never seen any evidence that they loaded weapons for the whites. Um, they denied it. And there's actually no evidence ever presented that they did so. So this, this charge basically is so powerful because it would mean that the IWW was anti-Soviet in, in that early phase of the Soviet Union, the IWW was not yet anti-communist. We're all leftists, um, you know, and so they supported the socialist uh, revolution, right? Um, the charge that the local aid had sort of betrayed the revolution was so powerful that um, the IWW national suspends local aid without even hearing from local aid, right? Um, now, I should say that it is illogical that the United States would have supplied weapons to um, the whites out of Philadelphia, in fact, um, they were sending weapons to the whites out of the Pacific coast ports because the whites were being receiving goods um, in Siberia, right? Um, and so it would make no sense for Philadelphia to be the sort of the point of debarkation. Um, and we know for a fact that Seattle dock workers found US weapons being loaded for the whites and stopped a shipment once, right? So there's documented evidence of the US loading weapons from Seattle, which would be the more logical port. Um, and so um, what's going on here? Well, Ben Fletcher, who knew much more about this than me, because he was there and I'm not, right, said this was a communist assert claim, right, that the communists wanted basically the IWW to support the, uh, the communists in the Soviet Union, but because the IWW was sympathetic to, but not yet willing to just join in mass, right, the communists dis chose to disrupt the most powerful left-wing organization in America that was not the communists. And in fact, in 1920, the communists were much smaller than the IWW, right, like, uh, and so this is disinformation intentionally created by pro-Soviet wobblies in New York to undermine the most powerful Philadelphia dock worker union, right, in nearby uh, Philly, right? Um, that may seem fanciful, but actually for those of us who know the history of uh, sort of the world, including the left, um, communist disruption of anti-communist forces on the left is in fact a, a common story, right? Like, uh, I'm not saying actually that's what happened. It actually is quite logical and reasonable to believe that, but there's actually not evidence for that either. Right, like uh, it's a lot of innuendo, but Fletcher very much believed it, right? Like uh, um, he repeated it throughout his life um, and he wasn't the only one, right? Like, uh, and it's reasonable given the context, right? Of that moment, right? Um, when 1920, when really what uh, Lenin is doing in the Soviet Union is trying to sort of attract more support from the uh, worldwide left um, uh, while they're somewhat besieged still by trying to get rid of the whites, right? Like, uh, and so, you know, Ultimately, Local 8 wasn't proven guilty of anything and was back, back into the union. But then, as he said, was suspended a second time for charging they had raised their dues um, to a much higher level than they had before the war in order to try to maintain a smaller labor supply, right? That's sort of conservative, right? Like, let's protect the current members instead of supporting revolution, right? Um, and so they were criticized for, by other wobblies for that. So there were two separate issues that together become known as the Philadelphia controversy. Ultimately, um, Local 8 reduces its membership dues and initiation fees again, gets back into the IWW. But the IWW was really weakened by that because after World War I, honestly, Local 8 was, if not the most important and strongest branch, it was among them. And so these sorts of internal divisions very much weaken. They already had suffered from external 
repression, right? Like uh, from bosses in the government, right? Like, uh, and so the Philadelphia controversy, even though it's very much in the weeds, and I spent a whole chapter in my book, Wild Weeds on the Waterfront, thinking about this, um, it's actually really important to help explain. And so I only hinted that in one of my slides. And so I appreciate that you um, raised the, the question now. Um, but like you said, in fact, does local aid seem conservative or radical within the sort of the IWW, especially over the issue of dues? Um, well, a lot of people said that they were not being revolutionary enough, right? Um, uh, local aid said, we've got the members, we've held on to this sort of power for eight, eight or nine years you should be supporting us, not weakening us, but you can see the criticism also, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. Um, and so um, these struggles, well, um, were real. Yeah, like, uh, like I said, complicated and um, very much weakened uh, local aid in the post-war one era. About Fletcher himself, I guess I'll ask a plain question. What do you find most compelling uh, about, about the man who clearly is compelling in many ways. <clears throat> so sadly, we don't have any audio, let alone video, right? Like, and so we, uh, it's, it, how do we animate this person who by all accounts is very dynamic um, through words alone on the page? That's not always so easy, right? Like um, that is ne nevertheless what is, right? I sometimes now, especially after this movie, you know, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah shows up, compare him to another young black revolutionary named Fred Hampton, who suddenly is far more famous, right? Like uh, Fred Hampton was around 20, right? When he joins the Panthers, Fletcher's around 20 when he joins the IWW, right? Um, both live in mighty industrial cities, right? Both are socialists, both uh, believe in revolutionary change or the need for it. Both are very much work with, although the Panthers are more nationalist, they very intentionally work with other um, ethnic and racial groups, most famously in the original Rainbow Coalition. Um, uh, and so the IWW did that, albeit in a different fashion, right? Like, um, and both suffered government repression. Fred, Fred Hampton obviously worse because he was murdered by the state. Um, Fletcher, however, goes to Leavenworth and um, well, that very logic, very possibly was the beginning of his health problems, although we don't know that for sure. Right? Like, um, and so, um, you know, that's the sort of person it was. And uh, again, the humor, also I like to highlight, I mean, I mentioned it briefly, it shows up in people's commentaries about him um, as well as in sort of reminiscences from those who knew him in later in life in New York City among his like wobbly and sort of circle of friends, right? Who, um, uh, and the majority of my book are actually original documents from the era, either written by Fletcher or about him. And the latter parts of the book, um, I enjoy immensely because it's sort of, you get to sort of feel how people who knew him sort of wrote about him, including sometimes after he died, right? Um, in obituaries and the like. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the heart of the book as, um, as a kind of political study or a challenge is um, the story of Fletcher as a major architect and agent of um, this program of direct action uh, as a means of not only labor activism, but, but social change as you describe it so aptly uh, of civil rights from, from below. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd ask if, if you care to, you know, speculate or speak about um, the, the prospects of that kind of activism um, today. I mean, it's something that preoccupies me, whether I'm talking about labor or civil rights or criminal law or whatever, this idea that, you know, this kind of chicken and egg argument, um, do, do, where do rights come from? Um, where are the kinds of... of, of of benefits and, and interest protecting programs and whatever you want to call them that workers and, 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 and minorities or whomever might have, where do they come from? And that, that raises this question. Uh, and it's a question that seems quite resonant with this story. So uh, I, I wonder if, um, if, if you might say a little more about that, about the lessons Fletcher leaves for us today thinking through these questions. Yeah, of course, I care about the past. I am fascinated by history. I have been for many years, but I appreciate that many of us aren't, right? I teach history and uh, teaching young people about uh, events that happened before they were alive can sometimes be a hard sell, right? Um, for me always, um, it's how do we make this history relevant, 
right? Um, why should I care about it now? And for me personally, although I'm fascinated by the past, I often say I care about the past because I care about the present. I want to know why things are the way they are now, um, why things are um, um, ungodly bad in many ways and unfair in particular, both before COVID broke out, but also during, right? Like, uh, and therefore in order to make a better future, right? Like, and so for, I think socialists, um, for Fletcher, um, for Wobblies, but also for even non-radicals, right? Like, it's like, well, I assume we all want the world to be better, right? Well, if you want that, you have to understand how we got here, right? Like, uh, and so for, for, for Fletcher, Right, but more broadly, the union that he was a part of, right? He he wouldn't want us to focus too much on him exclusively. An individual by himself does not make a union, right? Like uh, by definition, right? It's only collectively would would people have power? Would ordinary people have power? Rich people might be able to sort of act independently and individually because they have wealth. They can buy influence, right? For those of us who don't have that wealth, we counter that with numbers, right? Um, that's in whether it's the workplace or I'm not necessarily anti-voting, right? Like uh, if you want to sort of organize, there's multiple ways where one might exert power. Um, the most obvious example right now, obviously, is a little south and a little west of Asheville in Bessemer, Alabama, <laughs> right? Not far from Birmingham, where approximately 6,000 workers, mostly African American, are trying to sort of uh, form a union in the uh, most wealthy, powerful corporation in the world, right? Like a trillion dollar company, right? Um, with a, uh, the wealthiest, uh, the, the founder of that company is the wealthiest man in the world, right? Like a um, and you've got these 6,000 warehouse workers, mostly blacks, in a place where there's a long history, as you know, of union activism, including steel, right? Because Birmingham was a big steel town, right? Before it was a coal mining place and then mining and then making iron and then making steel. And Bessemer, of course, is the name of the steel process. Um, you know, literally the town was named after basically making steel, right? Like, uh, and so here it's different industry, right? Different time but not so different, right? Um, we've got workers who are deeply exploited, right? Where the employer is making fabulous profits and the workers for, uh, think that's unfair, right? They want more money, but they also want a safer workplace. Well, warehouse work and logistics work um, is often sort of, it's part of the same industry. Time is money is essentially the transportation, even though now it's sometimes called logistics as a supply chain, whatever term we use, right? Warehouse workers are actually no different than dock workers. Right? They're just moving cargo from, from basically production, from raw material to consume, consumption, right? Um, these workers only can have power if they work together, right? Um, they also are diverse, even if predominantly black. That means actually they have to work across racial boundaries that our country, despite our rhetoric, in fact, we know often are, are deep sources of division, right? Like, uh, and just having to stand up to powerful employers, right? Um, Shipping corporations, historically and presently, are very powerful multinational figures, right? And with the state that's not on the side of the people, right? Um, where the state regularly provides backup, basically, for Amazon. For example, um, in uh, sort of Bessemer, supposedly, right? The local police are actually running at interference for, for, the, for the company, right? Uh, it's common, actually, for police to often, in their free time, choose to be uh, hire themselves as security, often wearing their uniforms, right, um, even though they're off-duty, with their guns, right? Um, guns for hire, literally, right? Like, uh, um, you have a private police force with these sort of really, the, sort of the, the trappings of the state, right, who are intimidating these workers, right? Plus, as you know way better than me, because you teach this stuff for a living, right, the labor law in America is very anti-labor. Um, and so... Um, the, uh, it, I guess the last thing I'd say about this point, even though we could talk much further about it and maybe will, is guess what? In 1913, the, the odds were heavily stacked against these, these, these poor, diverse dock workers in Philadelphia. Um, they were able to sort of not only organize a union, they actually sort of joined the most radical union of their era, right? Like uh, um, if, I guess the other thing is knowing what is possible, if they can do it, it actually confirms that we can do it, right? Like uh, if it was not the case that they existed, maybe it's impossible. But um, of course, they also wanted much more than simply improving their conditions and wages. They wanted the world, right? And they haven't got it yet, um, or we haven't got it yet. But um, they sort of walked down the path, right? Um, and so I'd like to think that there is something meaningful about them for, for workers. Most of us are workers um, in our time. 
we can all decide for ourselves if 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 this resonates. Well, sure, that's that's great, and 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 I, I think it, it pays to note too, as you have the, that 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 local aid did this in a context when there, there was a, the the law didn't even pretend to support uh, what they were trying to do, anything that they were trying to do. Forget revolution, uh, or, or negotiating negotiating favorable contracts. Well, you and I could go on. I think some great great length. I have many more questions here, but. But the last thing I want to do is uh, is not uh, is for us not to get to the questions from uh, the audience, and I, I think our plan was to sort of transition to them. And I, I'm happy to, um, to to sort of serve some of them up if that's maybe the best way to handle this. Uh, I, I know um, uh, Andrew um, um, among the audience members uh, asked a really interesting question um, that, that often comes up. You, you had to um, uh, give me some guidance about this issue fairly recently, but the question is, um, what's with the wooden clogs uh, in, in, in IWW iconography, uh, which of course opens up the door to a broader conversation about, uh, about this business of, uh, of sabotage. Right, so the word sabotage is an inflammatory term Right, um, and it's often used as a whip, as you know better than me, against workers. Right, um, and so it. Um, but so sabotage comes from the French, right? Sabot, the root being um, a, a shoe, right? Like, a, and it was common in um, Europe uh, for for workers and peasants to make shoes out of wood, right? Like, um, and sometimes we see it in old photographs and movies that are historically accurate and whatnot, right? So the idea was that like uh, the wooden shoe, right, um, could be thrown into the machinery of a, say, in a factory in order to sort of stop production. Um, and so it's a way to basically um, get the get back at or sort of um, provoke the boss by doing something that the boss cared about, which is stopping work, which hits them in the pocketbook, right? Um, which is where bosses are most vulnerable, right? Um, and so, um, that could include any number of things. It might just mean actually slowing down. It doesn't necessarily mean destroying property, right? It could just mean um, doing things in a way that um, uh, reduce profit, right? Now there's a long history to that before there was such a term sabotage, right? Enslaved Africans in um, the American South, in, um, including in North Carolina, might do things like break tools um, to sort of express discontent and sort of lighten their loads, right? To sort of hit their, um, and so even before there was a term called sabotage in the United States, there was actually workers who employed sabotage, right? Like, um, but uh, it also more broadly just means using, using clever, cl workers using tactics independently or collectively in order to sort of um, surreptitious, surreptitiously undermine the employer, right? To weaken the employer, but also to empower oneself, right? Because if you can sort of pull something like this, you might actually sort of um, form alliances, sort of uh, feel stronger, maybe sort of become bolder, et cetera, right? Um, sometimes that also meant in some places, destruction of property, right? Um, and as you also know from your work in your forthcoming book, right? Like that was used, even the rhetoric was used against the IWW um, in trials all over, the, all over the country, right? Um, and so the wooden shoe, right, become, is a symbol that was widely employed uh, by the IWW in, in its posters and stickers and whatnot as a symbol of worker power, right? Um, along with the black cat, uh, another symbol that becomes closely associated with the IWW, even though it was not originated the sabotage, right? Um, and how it gets into the IWW, I mean, a friend of mine from, in my book, Wobbies of the World, I co-edited, Big Bill Haywood is in France, right? Um, in 1909 and 1910, where French workers were in fact um, on strike in the sort of uh, what telephone industry and destroyed some telephone lines, right? And Haywood came back to the US and basically brought this idea with him, right? Um, and there was also literature on sabotage that was translated into English that others like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn sort of brought into IWW circles and then beyond um, because the IWW was sort of, sort of anarchist um, and there were anarchists in anarchist organizations across the country and world who also sort of embraced some of these ideas right, um, uh, uh, that sort of, it becomes widely known. So even today you'll see someone with a wooden shoe tattoo, right, like, and in Philadelphia, there's a bookstore, an anarchist bookstore called The Wooden Shoe, right? Uh -huh. So there, uh, there are a couple of um, questions that I'll kind of combine into one, uh, which I, I think it's, 
some kind of fascinating resonance with what drove these men and women uh, in the IWW. And it's a question about, um, well, there, there are questions on the surface about the role of religion, either in the life of um, Fletcher himself or in um, the IWW. And, uh, you know, I want to anticipate your answer there because because I don't know uh, as, as nearly as well as you do. But, but I, I guess I can anticipate something about uh, the way this speaks to the level of commitment that people like Fletcher had to the cause that they were, um, that they were, that they were committed to. Um, so, you know, I, I guess to, to kind of rephrase it a little bit or rephrase a couple of these questions a little bit, what role religion of whatever sort uh, in shaping the IWW or faith is one of the questions puts it. Uh, belief, uh, whatever. That's a great question. I've never been asked it. Um, and honestly, I've never seen any a single reference to Ben Fletcher speaking to religious matters, period, right? Like uh, that might speak volumes or maybe it just means that, that uh, he didn't share that information, whatever, right? Like. Um, it's reasonable to conclude that his parents had some religious values and, and, and faith and beliefs because most African-Americans, especially in the 19th century did, although we don't really know. Um, for many people in the IWW, but also many who were, we might say observers of the IWW, they often said that the IWW was sort of like a religion, right? Um, that they very much believed in something bigger than themselves, that they had incredible hope and faith, right? And they were also believers as I believe all revolutionaries and socialists are, uh, that humans are essentially fundamentally good as opposed to evil, right? Um, that people in fact want to do the right thing and that if you believe in a socialist revolution, you're not doing it for yourself, right? You're doing it for others, right? For everyone, right? Like, uh, and by contrast, actually capitalists are selfish, right? Like uh, they want to get rich, which in a zero sum game, which is capitalism, if I win, you lose, right? Socialists by contrast want all of us to win. And so many people observed in the era of the, uh, the 19 teens, for example, that Wobblies seem to be religious fanatics of a sort, even though it was um, godless, right? Um, it was sort of like a religion, right? And also sort of like a political, not just a political identity, but that generally Wobblies rejected nationalism, right? Like, and so, uh, you know, are you an American? No, I'm a citizen of the world, right? Like, uh, um, I have no country because these countries, basically these nations are sort of represent sort of ideas that are anathema to IWW, but more broadly socialists, right? Like, uh, and so um, that's not a religion as in a believer in a higher power, but it's religious um, in the sense, in my opinion, in that it's sort of um, wanting to do something for the greater good, uh, but also believing that it's possible, right? Because um, if you didn't believe it's possible, why would you stick your neck out, right? Um, why would you mm. risk everything? Uh, and while we risked everything, many were killed and many were imprisoned. Um, and even if you weren't, you, you actually took that risk, right? Um, because you were seen as this outsider rebel. Now that might attract some people, right? Um, but it more typically sort of was used as a, a weapon against them, right? Um, as you also know well. And so Fletcher, to my knowledge, didn't have any religion in it. his burial. There is no mention of um, any religious words at all being said, right? Like, uh, and so I appreciate the question. I'm surprised I've never thought about it, um, but uh, you know, it, that's what I believe. I like to claim that I know more about Fletcher than anyone alive, just because I've chosen to devote a lot of my time to it. Um, but I would love to know more about that. And I'm sure there's infinite more about Fletcher that I don't know, right? Like, uh, but I don't think he had, I, I, I hesitate to call him an atheist, right? Uh, that might be uh, unfair, but he demonstrated no interest in organized religion <laughs> to my knowledge. No, but well, but well said though, right? That, 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 that there's a, a commitment here, a level of conviction that is that is religious in its depth, and, and Fletcher was was I, I suppose probably among many wobblies who, when they were inducted into prison, and back then you had to fill out a form. You know, a lot of these uh, folk would put um, address IWW uh, 
religion, IWW. Uh, and, and of course, some of them sort of um, em embrace kind of the identity of a, sort of the myth or whatever it may be of a kind of Christian martyrdom. That that's, that's, they, were like the, they were like the ancient Christians, you know, kind of martyred in that, in that fashion. But that's, that's all particularly, uh, that, that's all quite interesting. Um, there are a couple of other questions I want to be sure to get to in the, uh, in the, uh, the Q&A here. Um, what is about, um, you know, the relationship between the IWW and, um, and, and the Bolsheviks? And uh, you spoke about that in your, in your main presentation. Um, and, but, but I guess maybe the, 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 the anonymous attendee who poses the question wants to know a little bit more about that. Why the IWW didn't throw in uh, more strongly with, uh, with the Bolsheviks? Um, so that's a very important question and I appreciate it, right? Like, so when the Soviets uh, revolution began in 1917, the IWW, like others on the left around the world was breathless, right? Like um, the original, when you see how the IWW treated this, the Russian revolution in 1917, 1918, it's entirely positive, right? Like this is the beginning of the new world. Right? Like this is the first time that sort of a uh, group of people have been able to achieve in pro practice what people have been talking about actually for generations, going back to the really early 1800s, right? Like uh, it seems reasonable therefore, right? So like um, what happens next? Well, the Soviet Union starts to consolidate a little power under Lenin, right? Um, and then wants to sort of, um, sort of spread the revolution. So after World War I, right, there's actually attempted communist revolutions in Germany and in, in, in Hungary, right? Like there's also revolutionaries, revolutions happening in Ireland, right? Um, and sort of continuing onward in Mexico, right? As well as other places, right? Like um, yeah, what's happening is, is like people are sort of trying to figure it out, right? Like uh, there are some Wahlis who quickly join the communist party when it's founded. And there's actually several versions in, in the US in like 1919, 1920 before ultimately a, a consolidation of sorts, right? And this is happening in other countries, right? Like, uh, so communist parties are being born, right? And the vision of the Bolsheviks, right? Is sort of a, a political vanguard, a political party sort of gaining power one way or another, and then sort of implementing sort of, uh, sort of a socialism, but you know, by way of this dictatorship of the proletariat. Many others on the left who are more anarchist in their thinking, who are more suspicious of state power, very quickly are sort of suspicious, right? Um, they fear that basically the consolidation of power um, by the few, ostensibly on behalf of the all, the many, is problematic, right? Um, and, you know, famously, uh, the, the first group of Russians who really Lenin goes after who are leftists or anarchists, um, uh, in the early 1920s, and you know, famously also, right, there's sort of um, radical sailors who supported the revolution at Kronstadt, the big port, right, near St. Petersburg, rise up because they're complaining that basically the Soviet state is too centralized and too top down, and they are brutally suppressed and killed, led by Trotsky, who kills many of the people who are heroes of the original revolution in 1917, right? So the IWU is watching all this, right, uh, and actually attending events in Moscow. Right, uh, there is a series of conventions that happened in 1920, 1921, and onwards as the Soviets are trying to become the center of global socialism. Right, um, they create what's called the Communist International. Right, the IWW and other organizations similar you know, from other countries in Europe basically attend these conferences and start to think: Do we want to support this? Some lobbies do. Most famously, Big Bill Haywood will jump bail, right, um, and move to the Soviet Union, um, uh, leaving, of course, the bail money sort of in the government's <laughs> hands. And uh, but nevertheless, okay, so he and others, hundreds, thousands of Wabis, right? But the Wabis ultimately decide to keep the Soviets at arm's length because they don't like the way they play, right? Like uh, it's sort of um, sacrificing individual rights and freedoms and arguably democracy in the name of socialism to come at some future time, right? Where the sort of state power will diminish, right? Like at some future, future, future time, right? Um, Lenin, meanwhile, is ordering everyone to, to say, like, if you support this, you have to sign on to us. And if you don't, we are going to go after you, right? And so, especially in Europe, um, Lenin famously writes a book called Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder that's published in the summer of 1920, where he basically says, you, you get into the Communist Party if you're a lefty, 
or the mainstream labor movement so that we can basically seize the mainstream labor movements and pull them communist. The Wobblies disagree with that approach. And so the Wobblies choose to sort of remain separate from. Uh, and this, again, the same sort of debates happen in many countries, not always Wobblies, but other sort of similar groups or individuals who feel similarly. And then, well, you know, like the Soviet Union, we could sort of have a long conversation about it. Um, but well, you know, Stalin killed millions of his own people, right, before the Germans ever invaded, right? Um, uh, many people would say that the Wobblies were correct to be suspicious of the Soviet sort of version of socialism, right? Um, and you could debate that backwards, right? Like uh, there's responses to that, but um, the Wobblies basically didn't, uh, were more decentralized, more anarchistic, more suspicious of state power, right? More suspicious of top-down sort of um, approaches. And so therefore um, remained apart. The last thing I say about this is that despite what the Wobblies thought, and for better or worse, right, the communists in fact became the dominant force on the left in the United States, in most of the world. And the Wobblies in the US and in most of the other countries where the Wobblies organized diminished, right? Like, uh, and so as far as the leading force on the left, the IWW arguably was that in the 19 teens in the US, that was no longer the case by the 20s and by the 30s, it definitely wasn't, right? And the, where the Wobblies became tiny, almost invisible, the communists, in fact, rose in, in power and, and, and actually had great success on some levels in the US and elsewhere. And so was that a wrong turn for the left worldwide? Maybe, right? But that's what happened, right? Like, and, uh, but then this, obviously the Soviet Union collapses. Um, uh, it's, uh, now thinking about that the 20th century is uh, the Soviet revolution was so important. Was it a wrong turn? You could debate. You could you could make that argument and be a leftist, right? Um, mm. So the IWW was on that sort, right? Like they basically were suspicious. They were originally supportive, then they were skeptical, then they were anti, and then they became bitter rivals. Uh, mm. We probably heard both, but nevertheless, is what happened. Yeah, and you know you can make that same point even about um, raise those same questions about the path of the labor movement in this country and the, the communist success at kind of appropriating the left wing of the labor movement and, and how that first seemed to end well and then didn't seem to end so well. Uh, and, you know, here we are. Um, well, we have another question, which uh, I want to get to. Uh, it's, it's, it's again from Andrew, and it's about um, the nature of the appeal of, of anarcho-syndicalism to Black workers like Fletcher. Um, you know, what, what the extent of the appeal and, and I guess, um, the basis of it, um, and you speak in the book about, um, you touch on at least about the kind of, you know, the complex, rich political milieu of black politics that um, in the early 20th century that a guy like Fletcher found himself in. But I'm curious too uh, about that, uh, about that story or that part of this story. So sometimes we have to um, interpret actions without really knowing uh, what's in people's hearts and minds, right? Um, in fact, we do it all the time, um, especially historians who study non-elite people who don't necessarily write down everything they believed and weren't interviewed. And Fletcher, to my knowledge, only did one interview. He probably did more, but there's only one that I found ever. And, and as much as we know about Fletcher, we know far more about him than we know about most of the other African Americans in local aid, right? Like, so like um, we can so therefore interpret actions and we could be therefore misinterpreting, right? Uh, motivations. Um, so I say that because so what explains anarcho syndicalism, sort of a, a complicated term, right? But anarcho or anarchist um, syndicalist is another term used for basically unionists who um, believe in workplace power as opposed to say political or electoral power, right? Um, and anarchists sort of combine with that also because anarchists are generally suspicious of or opposed to state power period, right? Like, uh, so why would African-Americans, I'm not saying necessarily that most African-Americans in Philadelphia who work on the waterfront had deep thoughts about sort of um, political systems. Few of us do now, right? Like uh, why, uh, but, I sort of, the way I see it is that African-Americans had no reason to believe in, in the benefits of, of political democracy as it was sort of told, right? Like African-Americans were denied the right to vote. 
right? Like African Americans were um, stripped of their political rights by the Supreme Court in the 1890s, and you know, at the sort of the uh, sort of had a hangman's noose, right, across dozens of states, right? Um, when African Americans start to move in significant numbers in the 19 teens to industrial cities outside the South, some of them are able to register to vote and do vote, not all of them, right? Um, when they do, they also sort of encounter sort of in cities, including Philadelphia, where a so-called machine, basically one party dominates the political system. And so there are elections. Around is saying African Americans had no reason to believe that democracy worked, right? Um, they, they had lots of reasons to believe it didn't work, right? Um, and so I say this in contrast to the Socialist Party of America, which was running candidates for office. The most well known was Eugene Debs. Debs was a co founder of the IWW, although then they parted ways. The IWW basically didn't really think that there was much to sort of, okay, you get elected to the city council or mayors, that's not going to result in socialism, right? Like, a, um, no disrespect to the socialists, right? Like, um, but that was the wobbly view, that was Fletcher's view. Fletcher was perhaps less anarchistic than some other wobblies because in one document um, where he's, you know, uh, sort of recounted by an, a famous wobbly named Sam Dolgoff, that's in my book, right? Like, um, you know, Fletcher says, well, if you want to vote, vote, right? I'm not telling you not to vote, but, you know, don't, don't, don't be fool yourself in terms of the sort of the long-term sort of effects of voting in Fletcher's opinion, the one time we see Fletcher sort of offer an opinion about elections, right? Like, he's like, meh, right? Like, uh, um, and so my sense is, well, actually that, that very likely sort of reflected the views of many African-Americans, right? <laughs> they had little reason to believe, right? Uh, Woodrow Wilson, of course, was the, the president in the time that Fletcher was sort of came to power, right? In local aid, and he was a notorious segregationist, right? And so, um, uh, I also would point out that many European immigrants didn't choose to become citizens very quickly. It was only after World War I that there's this huge campaign to Americanize immigrants, which included teaching them English, but also making them citizens, and also the sort of the expansion of the use of passports and sort of official papers of any sort, right? Like, so my point is that actually the majority of local eight members had no reason to believe in democracy, right? Had no reason to think that sort of electing a Democrat or Republican would change anything whatsoever. They had reason to believe actually that power did vest itself greatest in the workplace and that their power, potential power was greatest there too, right? Um, and so, um, you know, that's a sort of a longish way. So I wouldn't say that African-Americans were anarcho-syndicalist necessarily, although no doubt some were in local aid, right? But it actually wouldn't have been a hard sell, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. don't vote. Who cares? Instead, let's hit the bosses where it counts, right? Uh, and in the short term, let's make some more money, right? Like I can, that's something I can relate to, right? Like uh, um, not let's vote for candidate A or B, right? As far as I can tell, people aren't gonna sort of benefit in 1920 period, right? Like, uh, um, and so that makes sense, even if it, even though I can't sort of quote specific African-Americans in Philadelphia in 1914, who are saying that, right? Um, but we know through their actions that well, they joined the local eight in the IWW, and that was it sort of jives, right? It sort of fits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very compelling part of his the story and the story around him, and the story you tell in your in, in your book um, in your book about dock workers. That you know, this movement, insofar as it was also a civil rights movement. Um, entails something that's often sort of wrongly left out of or forgotten in thinking about civil rights. And it's, it's, it's the labor dimension of it. It's, it's the appetite of black workers to be treated with dignity in the workplace and to have these, these jobs rationalized as they sometimes said, the way you're hired as you spoke about the shape up. And, and I, I really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate that. I, I wanna get to, uh, I guess there are a couple more questions, and we still have some time, I think. Um, so uh, one question is also about, um, spoke a little bit about this earlier, but maybe you want to say some more on it. Um, um, the role of the IWW, um, I guess, in these times today, and, um, and, and how do we continue, the questioner asked, the legacy of, of Ben Fletcher? Well, 
so I'm not a member of the IWW, although I'm friends with many. Um, I'd say that like one of the key ideas of the IWW in terms of labor organizing, which of course is their primary um, arena, is what they call organizing the unorganized. Too often mainstream unions have basically labeled whole categories of workers, whole industries as un, you know, no success, right? Why sort of waste our time, energy and resources to organize workers who aren't going to want to be union anyway, right? Um, service workers, right? Part-time workers, young workers, workers of color, immigrants, women, right? Um, et cetera, right? Like the IWW says no. We need all those people in the so-called one big union, right? Um, and so even in recent times, for example, um, it was the IWW that started, you know, the first modern union to try to organize baristas at Starbucks, right? 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, they tried to organize fast food workers at Jimmy John's in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, like 15 years ago, right? They were going after whole sectors where there's hundreds of thousands or millions of workers that the mainstream labor movement simply doesn't choose to invest in, right? They just have given up, right? Like now it's not entirely illogical. You have to prioritize where you use your resources, but like this is a large part of the economy. And arguably um, the goal is actually if you lift the bottom up, it actually benefits everybody, right? And so like when you have actually low wage workers, it pulls down like a anchor, everybody's wages and conditions, right? Um, and so in a capitalist world, right? Labor is a commodity, it is bought and sold, right? Like, uh, and so what do you do? You actually have to increase the cost of labor and everyone will actually benefit, right? Even you can make the argument that a high wage economy is logical and beneficial, right? Even within a capitalist world, a sort of a less painful one, right? Like, uh, and so, the IWW was trying to, in its small ways, because it has limited people and resources, to try to organize these workers. The AFL-CIO, which represents most of the mainstream labor movement, just never devoted itself to that, right? Like, uh, what other segments of our economy, right, um, simply have had zero efforts to organize, right? Um, you know, gig workers of various sorts come to mind white collar workers of many sorts, the sort of the emerging efforts to organize Google and other tech companies is sort of an interesting example, right? Because we're all workers, right? Like, I mean, uh, it's not just manual laborers, it's service workers, it's domestic workers, et cetera. The IWW was organizing, tried to organize domestic workers, right? In Colorado, where you live, um, women workers and domestic workers, and you know, a hundred years ago, right? Like there still is a need, right? For representing the, yeah, I, I'm not opposed to sort of making laws that sort of protect workers, domestic workers, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but you don't have to wait for that, right? You actually could attempt mm. to organize those groups. And so I think actually one of the important lessons of the IWW historically, but contemporaneously, right? Like is that um, you can organize the unorganized. You have to try, right? Like, uh, um, but actually those sort of might be where the greatest opportunities lie. Um, if you're sort of creative and open enough to sort of think in those ways. Unfortunately, many unions, and I'm a member of the American Federation of Teachers, so I'm in a mainstream union, right? Like, uh, um, aren't creative, right? Um, they're actually defensive. They've been fighting a defensive battle for 50 years and losing, right? Like, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and so it's nice to counterpunch for a change, right? Like, uh, um, uh, but often sort of, unions only represent their immediate members instead of thinking out of the box. No, that's not entirely always the case. It was actually unions that bankrolled the fight for 15, right? Um, which is actually mostly will benefit non-union workers, but will benefit actually everybody directly and indirectly um, by raising, again, the floor, right? Like uh, um, the idea that we're having a conversation about $15 minimum wage is only because actually activists, but especially union activists, including in mainstream unions like the SEIU were bankrolling this campaign for the last 15 years, right? Like, and so that's mm -hmm. actually a, a positive in my opinion, right? Um, that's the sort of thing that the Wobblies would think to do if they could actually have the capacity. The IWD was actually growing a bit in this time in the same way that DSA is growing in this time. Um, so it's bigger than it was last year and five years ago, um, but it is mm -hmm. still pretty small. So their campaigns are more localized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Peter. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back to Ash. Um, 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this really lively and in-depth discussion about, you know, not only the life and political act activity of Ben Fletcher, but also how it related to everything else was happening that was happening in the world during very revolutionary times and also connecting it to our contemporary moments. And yeah, I want to I want to thank everyone uh, who is in attendance tonight and all the questions that were submitted. Um, I don't know how many events you do, Peter, where someone asks an event, ask a question that you haven't actually thought about yet uh, in terms of, you know, the, the topic around Ben Fletcher's uh, spirituality. Um, so that was always cool to, to see. That's always cool to see. And Ahmed, thank you so much for having this discussion and running point on the Q&A there um, and bringing all of your insight into the discussion tonight. Um, so if folks haven't, please do check out uh, the book, Ben Fletcher, uh, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. It's the second edition. Um, I've dropped some links for it in, in, the, in the chat there. <laughs> Everybody's got their book. Um, and Peter, thank you so much for sharing with us um, all of your research and everything that you've learned through this process. Um, yeah, and I hope everybody has a great night. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this, and Firestorm Books and Ahmed White um, for being you. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night, y'all.